This week on Steve and Friends, we have Dirk Enz. Dirk is a German heterodox economist and also one of the leading proponents of MMT in Europe. Thanks for tuning in. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to Steve and Friends. I'm Ty Keens. It's April 1st, 2023. We have Dirk Enns in the house today. The world's on fire. Donald Trump's been indicted. But hey, the stock market's getting better because regional bank stocks are recovering. Um, happy you're here. Make sure you hit the like button if you're watching on YouTube. And also subscribe to the Prof. Steve Keen YouTube channel if you're watching on Twitter. You know what to do there. Hit the retweet and then like and then come over here and you can see our little chat is going on the side. You can come in, join the chat, ask questions, do all that fun stuff. Uh, just a reminder that we are kind of pseudo sponsored by Recast Studio, which you can find at recast.studio. They do audiograms. Um, so if you're doing a a live stream yourself or a podcast. Um, it'll take the text. It'll automatically take out the ums. And you all know I do a lot of ums. Um, um, so you can do that. They have multiple levels, free levels, paid levels. Check them out. They're really cool. They work with us. They give us the service for free. So we'd like to thank them. Um, I'm going to bring on Mr. Sanderson first. Hey. Daniel, how you doing, buddy? Really good, yes, very good. You, you know the ultimate questions coming here that I ask you every week, and I, I'm going to ask again, and I expect a good answer or at least a reasonable amount of words to fill up the time slot. How was your week? It's great. I'm wrestling with something. What are you wrestling with? Hierarchies in system dynamics and archetypes. Ar oh, archetypes. I, I think you may have seen a LinkedIn post. That's right. That's right you, right. you know what? We in the after show, I think that the archetype um, conversation is something that Mike can best discuss. I can do it, but Mike is obviously a Excited. professor in system dynamics. So cool. I think I think that'll be a question for him. Um, and speaking of Mike, we'll bring bring Mike on right now. Mike Radzicki. Mike. Hey everyone. I, <laughs> How was your week, Mike? Well, on the good side, I finished up my uh, drywall repair. So that's done. Uh, on the bad side, I'm doing my taxes. So that always Ooh. stinks. <laughs> Ooh, taxes. I remember last week I said have <laughs> something large and inspiring, and you brought up taxes. So now, now <laughs> good job, good job. Now we'll bring they give value to the, to the fiat currency. What can I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> we'll bring on the star of the show, Professor Steve Keen. Steve. How was your week, buddy? He's silent. Silent. You have muted yourself, Steve. We have you on our end live and unmuted. I can't hear you, but hey, that's 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 okay, buddy. You can work on that. We'll just kind of put you in the background again. We'll talk to Mike. Mike, um, I'm going to get you to read the list this week and put you on the spot with pronouncing these names. Here it is, our top chat, our top chatters from last week. Mike, go ahead. Well, we have uh, Ghost on the Half Shell. Lana Dell, hate the clock, hates the <laughs> clock. Joe Polito, WWE Fan 0104. J-Bay 088. Saranish, Agarwal, good. Amas, wow. Surdef. Or, uh, I'm not sure how the J is pronounced in that uh, on that name, but 
I mean, we kind of Americanized stuff here for good or bad. <laughs> um, you know, is it the Benoit or Benoit, right? Um, Real Progress in Action, Double K and Randy Hunt. Beautiful stuff. I, mm -hmm. I'm i going to be actually getting everyone to read those. So, Dan, it's your turn next week. And oh, then if, if we can get Steve's uh, audio working, he can read it uh, the week after. Let's try him again. Okay, so am I being heard now? Yes. Hooray. Okay, okay. Well, my week was absolutely dreadful. Terrible oh, week, oh. and I never want to have it happen again. I oh. turned 70. Oh. And I never want to turn 70 again. So that's that's sort of the highlight of the week. It was March 28. And uh, one of the positives of that was my best mate in uh, Amsterdam uh, took me out to a surprise event on the 29th and it ended up being a Van Morrison concert. Oh, wow. Which was rather nice. So, yeah, so good stuff. The only pity was that Van the Man decided to sing none of his own songs. He did covers of, you know, old, uh, old blues classics and stuff like that. When I think he's a great poet, and I would love to hear, you know, some thank yous here. I would love, love to hear some of his original stuff that I love, you know, Over the Water and Radio, Radio and so on, which are just marvellous, marvellous songs, Brown Eyed Girl. Um, mm. Just love it. But he didn't sing any of those, but it was great to hear his voice. So I've heard, you know, quite a few of my musical heroes, and that's one more off the list before he drops, the, before he drops off the mortal coil. Very nice. I'm not bad. I think. Thank Good. You. Well, mm -hmm. it, it, now here's the thing. 70, that's, you know, in my eyes, you're just more distinctive. You're of higher statesmanship. Um, and I'm honored to know a man like you, Steve. So it doesn't matter well, really I'll what your age is. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's yeah. bring on, let's bring on Dirk Enns. Let's do that, guys. Here he is, Dirk Enns. Dirk. Hey, thanks for having me. No happy problem. birthday, Steve, belatedly. Thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. So I usually, uh, I like to start the show with the the connecti connectivity between mm -hmm. Steve and the guests. So I'll maybe start with Steve. How do you know Dirk or how are you aware of Dirk? Well, we've met a few times, Dirk, at conferences. The, the most recent thing we got involved in was a, a modern monetary theory workout workshop in Poznan. Is that correct? That was the last time we saw each other? Yeah, yeah. that should be correct. And like Dirk, yeah, Dirk is uh, the, the sort of neoclassical economist. I wish all neoclassical economists were. He started out as one, saw some of the flaws in the theory, and is now post Keynesian and, and av avidly promoting modern monetary theory and realism about money. So he's somebody who saw the light and got out of the mainstream. And unfortunately, there's far too many stuck back on the dark. Uh, so, so, you know, uh, Dirk's the sort of person we need many, many men are of. I'm glad to have at least one of them. Yeah, Dirk, uh, Dirk, uh, from your your perspective, how did you meet Steve? And just tell me a little bit more about that, and then tell me a whole bunch about yourself. Okay, um, so I first met Steve through his book, Debunking Economics. Um, so I was I was doing a PhD on economic geography. New economic geography, which is this kind of mainstream models for recruitment, 1991 core periphery stuff. And then I understood after I finished my PhD that I did not understand money. So I, I asked my PhD advisor if I could just go on and, and do some research on money. And he said, Yeah, yeah just go, go on. And so I, I found Steve's book about like a critique of mainstream economics. And, and I'm, I'm very grateful for that book because otherwise, probably I would have to write it. <laughs> um, so, so Steve saved me a lot of time there. It was it was a brilliant book, and I understood. Okay, so yeah, I, I get it. I mean, it's it's not that neoclassical economics is somehow unreasonable. They have their ideas, they have their paradigm, and uh, the, the problem is that the paradigm, of course, is it's very tight, and money doesn't play a big role, and that's not suitable for for the twentieth century. It's also not suitable for the twenty first century. And my idea was to integrate money into new economic geography models. So I thought that I would just learn a little bit about money and then go back to my economic geography stuff. Um, so, so that didn't happen because understanding modern money took me a lot more time than I thought I would, I would use. And um, well, I, I was doing a lot of research on money and I, I was just interested in terms of institutional economics, how is money created in the Eurozone? So when the German government spends, um, where, 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 where's the magic money tree? 
is that in Berlin or in Frankfurt where the Bundesbank is? So it turned out that there's no there's no magic money tree and uh, that the German government spends by by having the German central bank crediting bank banks accounts. Um, and that's um, that was my my beginning uh, of, of becoming a heterodox uh, economist, um, trying to understand where money is coming from, because heterodox economists, they care about these ideas, they care about these, these things, um, whereas the mainstream economists, they, they don't care at all. They, they talk about public finance and thinking about gold nuggets that the government has to tax before they spend. Okay, so Dirk, I have a question for you. You mentioned something about um, economic geography, um, and that kind of I was. I, what did you mean by that? Okay, um, so in economics, we we have normally international economics, and we mean that we have exchange rates usually. Not if you follow the mainstream theoretical models, um, not the the trade models. They don't have exchange rates. But normally, when we talk about international economics. It's about exchange rates, so it's about depreciation or having a, an undervalued fixed exchange rate like China had for many years. It's about questions of development and it's about it's about the question of location and space um, or economic economic activity in space. And in economic geography, you talk about regions inside the nation. So there's there's a currency area, and you don't have the possibility to do to devalue your currency because there is no currency. It's economic geography not international economics. And I, I think that I, I, I wanted to examine how multinational corporations would change the economic geography of a region. Um, I was doing research on the Eurozone mostly, thinking about what happens when you have increasing returns to scale and when these large companies come from outside of your country, which is now a region, um, what would happen? And um, in, in the models, in the neoclassical models, the mainstream models that I did in my PhD, we kind of predicted that the companies would go where wages are low and where productivity would be high or relatively. Um, and then we checked re with reality and really said, no, no, um, the firms go where the wages are high um, because they're attracted by the high level of demand. And that's when I thought, oh, okay, so, when we leave the demand side and money out of the equation, we just look at supply side factors like productivity and wages, then we're missing the most important part of the story um, in economic geography, which is which is the demand side. And if you look at the Eurozone or the European Union, um, we have something which is called the blue banana. Uh, it's a concept uh, invented by uh, a French geographer in 1989. Um, Bruno something, I don't remember the last name, but Blue Banana, you can find that on the internet. So most of the location of, of the industry in the European Union is at the center. So Greater London, then go to uh, Paris, go to the Benelux countries, so Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, then the northwestern area, Rhine Ruhr of Germany, south of Germany, where you have Mercedes, BMW and so on, Siemens, Bosch, and then north of Italy. And that's about it. So you, you have something like a Blue Banana shape kind of thing. And almost all the industrial activity is, is concentrated there. And of course, it was an interesting question what would happen if you if you remove the euro, I uh, sorry, if you remove the, the national currencies and if you have no more exchange rates, then of course this would have consequences for economic geography. Uh, and it had. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm gonna throw my next question to Steve. Um, what I heard from Dirk is that demand is is a, a very strong economic determiner right? Uh, very influential. Does this um, put more influence on the supply demand um, uh, relationship in neoclassical, in your opinion? Or are, are you agreeing with what Dirk is saying? Definitely agreeing with Dirk. In fact, one of the few was all pieces of work out of economic is a telling theory of location. And I meant in, uh, in Dirk's Well, what we're going to do well, is we're going to suppress story, Steve for a, a second. One? We're going to let... <laughs> What? No, we're gonna we're gonna mute Steve on that because it just the sound is just not coming through and 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 his uh, good friend Mike is going to take and answer that question for him. <laughs> Mike, you're up. <laughs> well, there's yeah, there's a lot of lot to unpack there. So, uh, well, just the general idea of supply and demand. Our our uh, one of our founders of economics, Alfred Marshall, famously said that supply and demand are like the blades of a scissors. They, they work together. So to focus on one without the other and vice versa is usually not a good idea, I think, as a general economic principle. Um, I think 
uh, when you get into... Well, um, wait a minute. I have to raise my hand here. So what, what Dirk was saying is that, I mean, you have a steady supply of, of people, right? Is in, 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 in two geographical areas where people are not the issue, the supply of labor is not the issue. Um, is the demand the over is the more of a determining factor? Is that how I could look at that, Mike? Well, I mean, I I don't want to speak for Dirk, but all my my point is simply that I think we got, have to keep both in mind when we are um, analyzing something, and it's at our peril that we focus on one or or the other. Um, that's the only point I wanted to make there. Another. Point I just wanted to reinforce, which I thought was interesting, that what Dirk, Dirk mentioned, you know, how how money in the neoclassical paradigm is is kind of given uh, short shrift or swept to the side. I think in a lot, at least at the macro level, money is often seen as what we would say neutral in uh, in our models, our theories, which means that all the time, or at least in the long run. Uh, money only affects the general level of prices or the rate of inflation. It doesn't impact the real economy. And I think heterodox economists recognize that uh, financial factors, monetary factors indeed affect the real economy, output, employment, and what have you. Certainly that was um, Minsky's work and, and Steve's work in, uh, in that area would, uh, would mm -hmm. bear that out. Uh, the blue banana thing, I, I hadn't heard that one in a while. I heard that one in the past. That, that's a that's an interesting idea. And I think, you know, as I heard Dirk speaking, it, you know, reinforced in my mind, oh, yeah, there is that sort of corridor of in, in, of industry in, in, in Europe. And I thought that was interesting to rehear that. Uh, but on, on the, you know, what, the relative importance of uh, supply and demand, you know, certainly I'll finish with this, you know, in the, in the Keynesian paradigm, post-Keynesians demand – uh, is of the two is probably the more dominant uh, concept. Mm, okay. All right. All right. Steve, um, I'm going to bring you back because I think you, you, the sound is corrected and, and, you know, please elaborate for, for the audience here. Yeah, well, I think one of the most intriguing uh, theories in economics was Hotelling's theory of location. And this is what is sort of implied by Dirk's comments about the blue banana, because if you have a beach, which would therefore brings spacing, you know, the, the neoclassical anonymous, they only ignore well three things that really they only make three simplifying assumptions. They leave out space, time, and money. Okay. <laughs> okay. Those so are when you bring big space, ones. when you bring out when you bring space into economics, then you, you don't just locate a shop uh, in time. You locate it in a place as well. And Hotelling's theory said if you had a beach where the beach had a uniform distribution of customers, potential customers, then the most sensible location both for the first business and for the uh, customers on the beach is for the, uh, the the ice cream shop to locate halfway up the beach. And therefore, nobody has to walk more than 50% of the beach. But then if you have a, a second ice cream shop, the best place for the customers is one third for the first one and, one, and two thirds of the beach for the second. So nobody has to walk more than one sixth of the beach. To get to a shop, uh, and uh, and and that's the uh, the ideal location. But what will then happen is each firm, where if it moves towards where the other firm is, it gets more of the market. So if somebody sensibly, you know, nicely says, "I'll locate it at the two thirds location. You locate it at the one third. One of them will be an asshole, probably both of them will, but we'll take one uh, and move to the right next to the one uh, that is the setup of the one third location, cutting out." Uh, the customers for the one third. So what tends to happen? You all congregate at fifty percent, and you get a you get a concentration at one spot, and that's is a generic sense. That's what Stirk's talking about here. Uh, you get concentration where the power is, and uh, spatial stuff. Rather than getting a distribution chasing the cheapest wages, you get uh, people leaving areas with cheap wages because there are no jobs. They move to the cities, and everything congregates in the most populated and powerful areas and this i'm speaking slightly outside the eu here but i remember going uh being picked up at zagreb airport and going up to uh, um split i think it was in croatia uh for a conference i was speaking at there and on, just out of the blue the driver said oh this town has got no nobody lives in this town anymore where they're all gone they're all gone to croatia to uh to zagreb and they're all moving from zagreb to the, the eu so you get this depopulation so rather than as, as dirk said 
the manufacturers moving where the wages are cheap. People move from where the wages are cheap to where the cities were, and you get depopulation of, uh, of less powerful areas. Dirk, what's your, uh, let's bring you back. And uh, <clears throat> what, what are your thoughts? Um, do you have anything to add to that? Or um, are you in total yeah. agreement? Yeah, no, I, I agree. And um, because we have been talking a little bit about system dynamics before the show started, um, let me just take the conversation there. I mean, in neoclassical economics, it's all about the equilibrium. Okay, so it's, it's all static and the market clears. And if you are in the neoclassical world, if um, there's more demand for your product and you have a supply curve which is shaping upwards, then you get more expensive, costs go up, price goes up. So there's no problem in the sense that um, you ha can have a monopoly or that the company which is starting to get bigger gets to be much bigger and then they, the price comes down. So it's a nice world where, where you cannot outcompete your, your other fellows. Okay, it's all like an agricultural world. And if you are a farmer and you want to increase production, you have to take your, your um, you have to use these fields which are far away from, from your farm. And uh, maybe these fields, they don't have a good yield. And then when you produce more, costs go up. Um, but this is not how the world works, as, as Steve correctly said. It's, it's all processes which are dynamic and they're often cumulative processes which are self-reinforcing, which is what also Gunnar Mördal pointed out probably 50 years ago. And that's more a description of the real world. So if you, if you want to talk about the economy really you have to be talking about cities and regions and you will see that none of these regions or cities is somehow in equilibrium is static they're always growing or shrinking but but there's there's no there's no stagnation anywhere it's either going up or going down and and that's very very interesting um from a from a scientific point of view that if you really want to talk about the economy you have to you have to examine these economic processes and and you can see it happening for example in the Czech Republic where there's uh, automobile companies who, who have moved in in the last couple of, of years, so like 10 or 15 years ago, and then people get these jobs and they get more money and they move out of the city and they, they start to build houses where there's still the possibility to have a garden and so on, and then they start consuming all kinds of stuff. So it's very interesting to see the microeconomics more or less of, of the economy happening there. Um, so, so yeah, so I would say that, yes, the, the demand side matters quite a lot. Um, but one important thing is also that you have these increasing returns to scale. And that means you will not have economic activity everywhere, um, but it will be only in some locations where you have these industrial jobs and they are well paid. Uh, and that's what the people want. They want well paid jobs. And we have now this conversation about the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, for example. We now have the CHIP Act in the European Union, which is industrial policy to bring back microeconomics production. Um, so it's it's a completely different conversation now compared to 10 years ago. And I think the, the neoclassicals, um, I, I think they have they, their, their paradigm is currently fading. The politicians, they, they listen to heterodox stuff, even if they sometimes probably don't know it. Um, but that is things that, that we have been writing about for, for many decades. That's fascinating. Um, you, <clears throat> something popped into my mind as you were explaining that and, and making this um, comparison towards uh, an agrarian, agrarian society. And I thought, hey, you're, you're right. This is um, uh, on a larger scale. This is, um, uh, or I'll throw it out to everybody. This is the old paradigm that we are moving away from is the agrarian uh, mentality. Um, and it, it does surface in many uh, places just in, in society. I mean, we have summer holidays within school systems that were originally intended to have time off for youngsters to help their fathers and families with the fields and the crops and the harvests. Uh, why is it that we have summer holidays for two months for children? <laughs> like, you know, um, that's very interesting that maybe we're moving away from uh, that agrarians uh, sort of uh, economic uh, influence into and so the paradigm shift may actually subtly be changing as uh, as we speak very slowly. What are, what are you, what are your thoughts, Mike? Well, so a couple of um, things that leap to mind in, in hearing um, conversation here. Uh, one is when we talk about the attractiveness of a country, a city, a region, and what have you. 
it's an old concept in, in regional and urban economics, location theory, if we cut taxes in our state or our province, do businesses flock here and whatever. But in system dynamics, we uh, address that uh, quite extensively. Uh, there's an old uh, 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 collection of models in traditional economics called gravity models, where they try to take the laws of gravity to see you know, the, the attractiveness of, a, of an area. But in system dynamics, um, so if in particular, like the urban dynamics model, what causes people to want to move to a city? We have a particular sort of set of ideas as to uh, how to model that. Uh, in terms of Gunnar Myrdal and his concept of circular and cumulative causation, uh, from a system dynamics point of view, he talked a lot about positive feedback loops, as was mentioned, or increasing returns and what have you. But that can lead to uh, path dependency. So you get, uh, at some point, a system can get locked into a particular path or, or behavior. A location get, can get locked into being the place to do um, innovation or, or the Diamond District in New York or, or what have you. And um, this is a very interesting uh, set of ideas in economics. It, it, there's often inferior technologies that get locked in through path-dependent processes. Um, there are um, uh, what other example? Oh, there's a there's a very famous um, thing we teach in system dynamics to represent path dependency, and I'll, I'll end with this called a Paglia process. It's named after a mathematician named Paglia, and uh, to represent the idea, what you can see, conceive of is a um, a parfait glass or a, or a vase for flowers that's clear, and you put a Two colors, let's say black and white uh, marble, in the in the in the clear vase or, or parfait uh, container, and then you you have a rule. The rule says we're going to generate a random number between zero and one, and if the number is less than the fraction white, add a white marble; otherwise, add a black marble. Okay, so you know you start out 50-50. But um, if you, you happen to get, let's say, 0.3 as a random number, then now you have two white stones, marbles and one black. So the chance that the next random number is less than the fraction white is even higher. And you'll see that it, it, it'll, the fraction black and white will vary at the beginning, but then it'll lock into one path. And you can't, it's done. It'll be all mostly black, mostly white, but you can get any solution almost from 99% black to 99% white and anything in between. It just kind of depends on some random factors. But once it gets locked in, you're done. And I think that's a very important concept here in, um, in, uh, in well, in systems, but also uh, perhaps in uh, economic geography. So I'd just like to thank everybody for tuning in on YouTube. Make sure you hit the like button, subscribe. If you're watching on Twitter, you know what to do hit the retweet button like and then come over here join the chat that's going on over there where my finger is going through everybody i do have a question here and this is something that really interests me is we have the european union it has its own uh, central bank the ecb but it also has each central bank in each specific country how does that work uh, in, from an operational standpoint versus, let's say, the United States or Canada or Australia? What are the differences? How do sovereign bonds work? How does the system as a whole work with that hierarchy of the larger um, central bank, the ECB, with all the smaller ones underneath? Go ahead, Dirk. Yeah, yeah, that's, of course, a very important question. Um, so the um, in the United States, you have the Federal Reserve System, and the equivalent in Europe is the uh, Euro System. So actually, our central bank is not the ECB, but it's the ECB plus the national central banks. So all of these can create money. So this means that if you are a German bank, you will have your account not with the ECB, but you will have it with Bundesbank. If you are in Spain, you will have the bank's account at the Banco de España and so on. So um, all these national central banks work, of course, uh, for the euro system. So they are not independent, which means that in terms of collateral requirements, everything is standardized and also in terms of interest rates. 
Okay, so it's a little bit like the regional FAT uh, in the United States, um, which also do not uh, do not have a lot of leeway. So the ECB decides about the collateral and the interest rates and what kind of asset purchase programs they want to do. Um, so they are very, very important and because they are more or less the, the decision maker. And um, I think last year a student of mine asked me, so, so who has an account with the ECB then? <laughs> And uh, I, said, I said, well, I don't know, I'll, I'll write with the ECB. And I had to write to them again because it took them two weeks to figure that one out. Uh, but in the end, they replied to me and they said, look, the, the European Commission has an account with us. And I think they said also a couple of other European institutions, so EU institutions, uh, probably the, the European Investment Bank, for example, probably has an account with the ECB directly. And then foreign central banks. Um, so probably the Fed has also an account. Um, but no European banks, for example, have an account with the ECB. Um, so, well, how does it work when it comes to, to government spending and bond issuance? Um, so in, I can describe this only for Germany because I, I have not found any other information about other countries. So in Germany, at least, um, it's the Ministry of Finance indirectly, which is issuing the bonds. Um, but first the government spends so the german federal government spends for example 100 million on something which means their account at the central bank goes negative um then they have to fill that account back to zero because otherwise the central bank is not allowed to to execute their spending the next day okay so it's it's very mmt like so first they spend account goes negative and then they can fill up that account with tax revenues and bond revenues so if they spend 100 million and they get back, I don't know, 50 million in taxes on that day, there's a gap of 50 million euros. They can sell bonds worth 50 million, which of course is convenient because you just have injected 100 million net, uh, sorry, 100 million by, by government spending. So the banks have more reserves, more central bank deposits. 50 of those central bank, 50 million of those central bank deposits return to the government because of tax payments. And then the, the other 50 million the banks are saying, okay, so what do we do with 50 million euros of central bank deposits? And at that point, the German finance ministry says, well, we will sell 50 million euros worth of government bonds. How about that? So they just have to make sure that the interest rate on those governments is, uh, government bonds is higher than the rate that the ECB has, so the deposit rate. And then, of course, the banks have all the incentives in the world to, to purchase those government bonds because they, they can make more money with that. And of course, the big question in the Eurozone is, <laughs> is there a demand for those government bonds? So if there is no demand for those government bonds, like in 2010, um, when Greece, for example, had financial troubles and the ECB said, we are not the dealer of last resort, so we don't help you buying up government bonds. Then, of course, the private banks, which are the only buyers uh, from, from government bonds or off government bonds, uh, then, of course, they might say, well, we don't want them anymore. So, so Greece, the Greek government, they ran out of money in 2010 with a public debt to GDP ratio of 130. But if the ECB says we will buy up those government bonds from Greece, um, all of them, if we have to, then of course, what happened in 2020 is that with a public debt to GDP ratio of 210%, and it was even higher than that, Greece still did not run out of money. Okay, so the amazing thing is that we in the Eurozone, we have had a completely different policy reaction uh, to the pandemic compared to before during the global financial crisis and well, afterwards they, they imposed austerity. Um, but now they, they changed a couple of things and now the ECB plays a different role. I hope that this explains at least half of the questions that you asked. Mm. So you don't see them as being uh, having to tax tax and sell bonds first and spend later. They're still spending first and tax and bonds afterwards. But the difference being that the interest rate is uh, is something which actually is more market determined than it is in America. Would that be correct? Well, the, the ECB can still do um, repos. So so that means that when the government injects by spending more, they will use repos probably to to stabilize the rate. And then probably the fiscal authority will also start to sell their government bonds. Um, so they, they are also able to keep the interest rate in the interbank market stable. So it's not the violent up and down um, of, of adding and, and, and subtracting reserves. So it's not as perfect as in Canada, but it works reasonably well. Okay. 
So what do you, what is your what is your main work yourself on in MMT type issues at the moment? Is that the main research area still for you? And what are you doing in it if it is? Yeah, well, um, well, I'm, what I'm working right on what I'm working on right now is I've I've just completed a textbook in German, a macroeconomics textbook, um, where I explain mm -hmm. money creation and then I I aggregate to get those sectoral balances. Um, so that's what I'm working on. And I have written a policy paper, which is already two years ago. I will have to follow up on that. So um, there's a lot of things happening. We have now a reform of the fiscal framework of the of the Eurozone, which is coming up. Um, and I will be writing about that. And also I will be writing with two friends of mine about the question of MMT and what it means when you have a country in the world economy. Um, so MMT says with your own money, you can access the resources in your, in your own country. But MMT does not say, of course, that uh, with your own money, you can always buy stuff from foreigners and they will always be willing to sell. So the international situation is a very political situation. And um, starting or going back to chartalism, Georg Friedrich Knapp invented that kind of concept in 1905. Um, but he said very clearly that domestic the domestic money ends at the border. Okay, everything that is beyond that is is complicated and difficult. And um, yeah, that's I think. That, but it's since it matters to a lot of people, I think it's nice to to write another paper about this and and think about the monetary pyramid and the role of the dollar and these kind of things. That's very interesting, Dirk. That the that, that there's a, a distinction between um, domestic. Um, a domestic application or use of MMT and money, money creation versus um, international uh, money creation and and the fact that politics comes into play with that. Um, so um, how do you model that? How do you model the geopolitical uh, subjectivity into into complex systems is that is that and and system dynamics how would you how would you approach that as a economist yeah well I, I think institutions matter and and you have to understand the institutions first so um just for example if there's some kind of deal a political deal that the saudis are willing to sell oil for dollars then of course there will be a lot of demand for dollars which does not come out of the fact that the U.S. government is taxing people in U.S. dollars, like inside the country. Mm -hmm. But internationally, of course, it's very convenient. If you save in U.S. dollars, you know that you can always buy oil for that kind of money. And you can always buy American weapon systems. So these, of course, are political things. And then, of course, when you are modeling, then you would say, well, so how much can um, Americans, so including private sector, so business and household, but also the American government, how much can they buy from foreigners? And the answer would be, well, almost everything they want probably <laughs> because the foreigners, they want dollars. They're okay with that. Um, so in that sense, I would I would model it like, like this and say, look, if the US government or anybody in the US starts spending a lot on, on imports, probably the dollar exchange rate will not go down by much because the, the global economy will happily absorb the dollars and not exchange and swap them into their local currency, which would mean that the currency is, is going down. So if you have a small country, which is which is economically like a, maybe a, de a developing country, well, if they start importing a lot of stuff, paying with their money, then of course the exporters will always swap that money directly for, for their own domestic currency, because if you're an exporting company, most of your costs are probably in domestic currency. So the foreigners can pay with their own money. That's OK. But you go to the financial markets afterwards and you swap those currencies for your domestic currency. And that means that if you import more, your exchange rate goes down. And yeah, of course, if you have a currency which is, is going down very quickly, then, of course, the exporters are not happy to be paid in that current currency. Um, so they will, they will ask for, for being paid in dollars or euros or, or one of the harder currencies. That's fascinating. So there can be a case, a case can be made for uh, the strength of, of, a, of, of a dollar or the US dollar to have it um, uh, spread around the world and used as uh, a, and continue to be used as a, a baseline currency. Um, what are your thoughts about um, other, na um, other nations moving into that role? I know this is kind of speculative, but any, any thoughts on 
on on the long term value of the U.S. currency in relation to say other other currencies around the world? What are what are you what are you seeing in your position from your perspective, Dirk? Um, okay, that would be investment advice that cost extra. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's very open. Uh, I think the dollar is very strong right now. Obviously, I mean, it was one to one a couple of of months ago, and I think that things will be reversing a little bit in in the future. Um, hopefully, because I go to the US in June. Um, but I mean, when it comes to the renminbi, for example, and other currencies. Well, I mean, it's I mean, the, the place in the hierarchy of, of international currencies, I think it's more as a consequence of of the real economic activities and the financial activities of your country over the last couple of decades. So I don't think that um, that the, the international pi- pyramid of money is, is in, a, in a way determining the fate of nations, but it's rather in a reflection of, of what has been happening in the last couple of decades. So China, for example, in 1980, it had one of the worst currencies of the world. Nobody wanted that currency in 1980. Okay, so that's that's only uh, 43 years ago. And look where the renminbi is now. I mean, some people say that that if you have a currency and you cannot buy imports with that kind of currency, then then there's nothing you can do. But China, of course, which which is a special case, I admit that. Uh, but China has shown that that even if you have a currency which is not traded at almost at all, uh, then still it's possible for you to develop. So the one thing that that modern monetary theory says is that with your own currency, you can always um, well use the resources that you have inside your economy. Okay, and and that's that's really the main thing. Okay. Um, I'm I'm gonna get this. Uh, I'm gonna get you to comment. I don't know what a band core plan is, and I'm gonna throw this out to Steve and and Mike, and then I'm gonna bring Dirk back into this. Um, uh, St- Steve, Mike, can you explain what a band core plan is? Oh, well, that's that was Keynes' original idea for Bretton Woods. There wouldn't be um, a national currency for international trade. You'd have a currency created by fiat at the international level, which he called the band core. And the band core was going to be distributed, I think, by what became the International Monetary Fund. And uh, the trouble was that the Americans, uh, represented by Harvey Dexter White, I think his name was, at uh, Bretton Woods, insisted, no, we want the American dollar as the international currency. And that had the effects that Dirk is talking about. Uh, you know, people have a demand for the American dollar over and above the demand for American goods. So you get an overvalued American currency in a very muscular and, and powerful American financial system, uh, which is the, the benefit America got out of that. But I think it helped deindustrialize America because it meant, meant that the exchange rate was that much higher than it would have been without it. So I, I would, I'm always somebody, I, I hark back to the bank, right? That's what I'd, I'd like to see the system become. But I know that uh, we're going to be stuck, I think, with the American dollar indefinitely. Dirk? What are what's your take on on Keynes's uh, uh, Bancor uh, plan? Universal universal uh, currency, I guess we could say, right? Yeah, it was um, it was meant to be a central or yeah, international currency. So a central bank for central banks would have been created, and the idea was to to punish countries which have uh, trade deficits, but also to punish those countries which have trade surpluses. So if you if you export more than you import in a world where there's not enough demand, which is the normal case, then of course you you have more employment than the other countries which which have current account deficits or trade account deficits. So um, I think before or in 1929, when the Great Crash happened and the Great Depression started, um, a lot of a lot of economists blamed it also on on tariffs which went up. So countries started to protect their markets. And protect their, their aggregate demand by increasing increasing tariffs. So, so the banco was was addressing this kind of problem um, that that countries, because they knew that demand was very important for economic development, would somehow um, move their countries into auto, positions of autarky, uh, stopped stopping to trade. So that, for example, happened in Spain. So Spain, under the dictatorship in the 1940s was was almost completely closed. So they, they had very, very little international trade. And um, so the, the banker, to some extent, um, 
has been has been realized in the eurozone so we have a macroeconomic imbalance procedure and countries that have high trade deficits are punished and countries that have high surpluses uh, are punished at least in theory um, it's a bit asymmetric i think you are punished when your deficit is four percent or higher but if your surplus is six percent it's still okay so only above six percent you will be punished um, but I think they don't enforce it. Um, so, so the banco was really, uh, really meant to be enforced that that uh, that those countries with with too high surpluses and too high deficits would would pay penalties. Mike, uh, tell me what you you know. You're a pretty big uh, historian on economics. What do you think of the bank, or and if it had been employed? Yeah, it's uh, it was a great idea. Uh, Steve is absolutely right that. Um, the uh, nations of the world sent their representatives to Bretton Woods, uh, New Hampshire, which is about uh, two or so hours uh, from my house. Uh, we often go up there for skiing uh, vacations. You can stay in Keynes's room or the room he stayed in if you want. They have the room where the Bretton Woods uh, treaty was signed and all that. And uh, basically the U.S. said, yeah, we won the war, uh, so we're going to do it our way. But Keynes's system was much more elegant, I think. And it, throughout Keynes's thinking, he if we put on our systems hats for a minute, uh, he, he thought about negative feedback loops. He thought about um, uh, systems to stabilize economies that tend to be unstable. So the bank or is a system that would help stabilize uh, the international trade system, just like his you know deficit spending ideas would help stabilize the economy during economic downturns. So it kind of reveals what was in the guy's mind in a sense when he thought about these big problems. Okay, well, okay, well I gotta unmute myself here. We're getting close. Um, well, we still got another 10 minutes, but I wanna, I wanna let Dirk have some time to tell us what he thinks where economics needs to go? What are the deficiencies in economics now? How can we move forward to make um, the world a better place, uh, to make citizens of each uh, nation happier and more fruitful? How we can take care of third world countries, so the global south? What what are the processes um, behind that uh, thought that can get us there, in your words, Dirk? Thanks for the question. Um, so I think we, we need to change economics first because economics is a lens that we use to look at the world. And uh, as Steve said, we need to look at money. Uh, we need to look at space. We need to look at time, um, which is the old recipe of institutional economics. So we have done that. And, and some of us are still doing this kind of, of economics. And well, we need to add some facts also about the production function. We need to uh, put in their energy and resources. And um, I think we we had we ha we have we have an economics which is kind of geared towards answering the 20th century problems. Um, but now we have 21st century problems, and that means we always have to think about resources and energy in whatever we, we are doing. So. Macroeconomics cannot be divided from, from the microeconomics of, of production and also not from the microeconomics of, of distribution. So this means that things will be more complicated in the future um, because in the past, everybody said roughly, well, okay, um, we can just increase consumption so that people are happy. Um, yes, there will be more energy produced and more, more resources used, but, but that's not a problem. That's what people thought 50 years ago. Smart people already knew back then that that would be a problem. Um, but now we, these, these things have come back to bite us and, um, and we need to, to account for that. So um, 10 years ago, I had people coming to me saying, look, in your macroeconomic model, there's no energy, there's no resources. And I said, yes, but because these are more important. This is just a macroeconomic model. Okay, this is about full employment and price stability. But if you want to talk about resources, that's that's a level higher up. Okay, so, so you have to say, well, the first condition of my economy is that it's sustainable, that I don't use too many resources. So I cannot even use the resources I have because if I burn all the coal, then we would have a lot of global warming and that would be bad. So the problem is not that the planet will, will die, but that the nature will die and we will die with nature. 
So I'm I'm happy to speak about natural boundaries of the planet. Uh, the planet itself, again, is, is, is rather safe. It will be swallowed by the sun at some point, but that's not our problem. Um, so, so that is a, an issue that, that we will have to talk about quite a lot. And then, of course, distribution matters. So, so how do we get people into these kind of new positions? And what do we do about the inequality? So, so we do have a lot of surplus in the sense that we produce way more than we have to would have to consume. Um, so how do we distribute and redistribute the surplus? And um, the, the financialization of the last kind of decades has shown that if you if you are a hedge fund manager, for example, you can easily have an or easily or not, but you can have an annual income of more than than a billion dollars per year for a couple of years. Um, so so <coughs> sorry. So why is that? Um, so so that needs to be stopped. Um, and we need to also we need to stop the power of the fossil industry. Um, that need to needs to be reined in. So so for example, at some point we could talk about nationalization of of coal mines, for example, and oil wells, um, and and then the government could decide what to do. So it's um, it's something which means that we have to to move away from the the very simple and and nice world that we had, um, because in that kind of world we we create a lot of problems. And I think the the worst problems are inequality, um, because it's damaging to democracy our democracies, um, and it's also creating this this mega consumption by the super rich okay so so people who are uh maybe in the the lower 50 percent in terms of income in developed countries even their consumption is kind of okay even um they will have to reduce it a little bit but it's those who are consuming quite a lot so the upper 10 percent of income in every every developed country mostly they will have to cut their consumption and that means that that inequality is also behind the sustainability issue. And um, well, the textbooks, of course, that we have, they, they solve the problems of, of the 20th century, how to avoid um, like, like a wage price spiral. So how, to, to, uh, how to, to take power away from unions, how to use monetary policy to create unemployment so that unions are not powerful. So, so of course, they, they solve those problems by creating new problems, which is the inequality thing. Um, so, yeah, we have now different kind of problems and um, we need the different kind of economics. And when it comes also to development strategies and when it comes to the global south and how do we how do we make sure that that we also have a fair world economy? Um, well, then, of course, we need to rethink um, the way that that in this industrial activity is located on this planet. So we go back now to this discussion about uh, in industrial location in space. Um, when you have increasing returns to scale, we will not have factories everywhere because it doesn't it doesn't work that way. So you have big factories and they are located centrally normally, um, and we have to we have to you know, we have to address those kind of questions. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that there will be a, maybe a little bit of a revolution evolution slash revolution in economics because the old economics doesn't help us to to fight our problems. It was obvious also in 2020 when the pandemic hit us in the eurozone. Uh, the the uh, the old rules were flying out of the window. The stability and growth pact was was taken out. Um, so there was a general escape clause which was activated. The ECB finally said we we'll, are now dealer of last resort. So we make sure that the governments don't run out of money in this pandemic. Then the com the national government started to fight inflation by lowering VAT by um, changing some subsidies. So for example, in Spain now. Inflation is very low compared to Austria, where they didn't do that. So we now have well, we have national governments um, taking care of inflation. It, it used to be a thing of of central banks, um, but in in practice, the national governments don't listen to the mainstream economists anymore. Um, also, when it comes to inflation, they said, "Well, we just have to increase the supply of energy, so maybe we we should build more energy plants and sustainable energy." In our, inside our country. So we use government spending to solve a price stability issue. So we already have moved into a world where policymakers listen to, to heterodox economics and policy advisors, and the mainstream models and their ideas are, are, are not working. Um, last point is also that the idea to have CO2 certificates, which are priced, and then this can fix the whole sustainability issue. Um, maybe if you would have started 50 years ago, it would have been we would have been able to have a, a nice pass to adjust 
um, to lower lower emissions, uh, but it's too late now. So the CO2 budget is, is basically zero at the end of the decade. Um, so so by the end of the decade, we, we basically cannot burn fuel anymore, um, fossil fuel. And now, of course, whether you can you, you sell CO2 certificates at a thousand euros per, per ton, or you say, well, at the at the gas station, uh, it will be 10 euros per liter of, of gas. Well, I mean, you might as well outlaw it. It's just way too expensive and people wouldn't buy it anyway. Um, so these market-based solutions, they have failed us. And the, the governments have started looking elsewhere for some years by now. Well, that's a, a whole lot of people should have took the limits to growth more seriously 50 years ago. I want to get Steve's uh, kind of final word on Dirk Entz and how important he is to economics moving forward. Steve, give that opinion to me, please. Oh, well, Dirk's playing a, a very valuable role in, in Germany as, as uh, one of the leading people contributing to economic realism. And that's the, the, the great problem we have is that we are dominated by a bunch of economic fantasists. That's what neoclassical economists really are. I think I'd probably, I'm think i thinking considering seeing if I can get my fellow post-Keynesians to rename Tolmake astronomy, Tolmake economists. That's a better characterization of their uh, of their belief system. Um, so we, we're, we're effectively the Copernican economists. We're trying to say we've got a realistic model of how the economy functions uh, and it's simpler, strangely enough, than the neoclassical. Uh, but there are many, many elements we still haven't properly incorporated. So Dirk is helping out immensely on popularizing realistic economics in Germany, uh, the importance of understanding money, the way that a monetary economy is completely different to a, uh, a barter economy, which has never existed anyway, but is the neoclassical fantasy. So the, the frustration I'm feeling, something as I get older, uh, is that you know, I understand how Galileo felt uh, trying to get these Ptolemaic astronomers to look through the telescope and see the four moons of Jupiter that he discovered that, according to their theory, could not exist. And they steadfastly refused to look through the telescope. And the same thing is happening now with neoclassicals with that idiot uh, Bernanke uh, getting the Nobel Prize last year uh, for models which still don't take into account money, money seriously. And yet he tries to analyse what causes financial crises. So, uh, you know, the more the more the merrier. I mean, a lot more Dirks, but I'm afraid we're not breeding Dirks as fast as we're breeding clones of Bernanke. And yes, it is more like a death cult, as uh, Ghost in the Half Shell is saying there. And I frankly, I, I do actually believe capitalism will collapse before uh, neoclassical economists give way in their beliefs. And they'll cause the collapse. Well, this is the first hour of Steve and Friends. Uh, I really like to thank Dirk for coming on the show. Um, I'm glad I put out that controversial tweet about two months ago because I hooked up with probably, I'm putting them in my top five economists this year. So really, really appreciate it. I'm going to let Dirk have the final word. What do you need to say before you go, Dirk? Well, uh, thanks to all of you. It was a pleasure to be on the show. Uh, and I like where this is going. So yeah, I hope to be invited again sometime in the future. And I hope you enjoy the second hour as well. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thanks, Dirk. So everybody, if you uh, stay tuned, uh, we're going to do the after show next. Dirk is going to go on his merry way and do some family stuff. We're definitely going to have him back in the future. He's a great guy. Stay tuned. We're going to the next part now. See you later. Uh, we did it again. Now, as I said, our last show was canceled after you appeared on it. So fingers crossed the executives don't do that again. The more I read in the neoclassical thing, the more I just, you know, my scratching my eyeballs out all the time. I'm the voice of God in the background. Oh, geez. <laughs> once, once the coins get uh, warm enough because of your body temperature in the winter, it actually keeps you <laughs> moderate beer drinking in the evenings. Well, that's inspiring yeah. for a Saturday morning.
Talking on the phone getting out of hand? Look out! You need phone relief. The ultimate in hands-free phone design. Watch. Simply attach the special bubble back fastener to any phone. Then attach the phone relief headset. It's that easy. Hands-free, pain-free. You'll wonder how you ever lived without it. It's perfect for remotes. Now talk hands-free anywhere, anytime. Office work is a pain for Mr. Phone in the Neck, but you won't miss a beat with hands-free freedom. A must for the entire office. Work goes quicker and easier. The padded headset removes the easily and is fully adjustable. Best of all, Phone Relief works with your favorite phone, an amazing breakthrough product you'll use every day. Now only $12.95. Call toll-free to order by credit card and make this your last phone of the neck. Oh, gee. Oh. oh, phone in the neck. That's our latest sponsor for Prof. Steve Keen and friends. Uh, thanks for sticking with us into the second hour. Um, I want to give props to all the chatters, and I want to actually, before we get to that, thank you, Dirk Entz. That was a beautiful conversation. Definitely a beautiful man. We're going to have him again for sure. Um, it's sensible economics, and we need more sensible economists. I'll go through the list. Actually, maybe I got Mike to do it. We'll get Dan to do the list next. Is Dan prepared to, to come on here? We'll unmute him. Dan, yep. are you are you prepared to read the list? Yeah, yeah. Are we, are we saying for next week or right now? This is for this week. I'm going to bring it up. Okay. Start start naming the names, buddy. Okay, Ghost on the Half Shell. Lana Adele hates the clock. Joe uh, Polito. Uh, WWE fan 0104. J Bay 088. Oh. Sarah Nesh. Edgar Wall, uh, Thomas Suraj, I don't know, uh, Real Progress in Action, Double K, and Randy Hunt. So we're going we're gonna to train Dan on how to be a little more flamboyant doing live streams. So we got Ghost on the Half Shelf, Lana Dell, Joe Polito, WWE Fan, Jay Bay, Sarah <laughs> Ogaral, Thomas, Real Progress in Action, Double K, and Randy Hunt. Thank you for chatting every week uh, in the chat section right beside Dan. We really appreciate it. We are in the after show. We're going, to, I'm now I was planning to do a little demonstration with Minsky. I'm not quite prepared to do that. What we're going to do is actually play um, a Minsky promotional video that I do on my channel. It's about 10 minutes long because I want people to see what Minsky is. Not everybody knows, for one, what System Dynamics is that watches the show. And the, the further that along, not everybody knows what Minsky is um, and how it relates to System Dynamics and how you can use it to model. So we'll play that video in a bit. And I want to see what the reaction is to our viewers. If, if this is something we should spend 10 or 15 minutes on in in the after show each week, or if people's, you know, we can see their eyeballs through the chats, just kind of glaze over. Um, we'll bring on the man, Mike Radzicki. We'll bring on Steve Keen and Steve is frozen. So we'll just take him off. Mike, what do you, what did you think of Dirk and your opinion? I really enjoyed his um, talk because um, I always want to know more about the the Euro, uh, Euro land and how it mechanically operates. I'm not as uh, familiar with that as I am with, uh, you know, the United States system. Um, I'm delighted to hear him say, I was delighted to hear him say that, well, when his student asked him a question about who has an account at the European Central Bank, he said, I don't know, I'll find out. And he picked up the phone and he called. I think that's what economists should be doing, that sort of thing, and they don't do it. They go and build a model of a commercial bank, but they barely set foot in one. They go build a model of a, of a central bank system, and they have no idea. I mean, they've never gone to a central bank and said, what do you do? <laughs> in system dynamics, we like to do that. We will build a corporate sector by going to the company and saying, what do you do all day? And people can tell you what they do. So, you know, he's the right thinking kind of economist. And I think rather than, you know, the real world, you know, you have economic theory and then you have the real world. Traditionally, the real world is you go to a website, you download a flat file of some sort, you know, Excel or CSV or whatever, and then you torture it with 
econometrics. You never get out from behind your desk as a traditionally trained economist and find out what's happening in the real economy. <laughs> and that's kind of weird to me. I think it's because, well, you, you want to publish papers and journals. You don't necessarily want to make the economy better. Right. And you're taught what you're taught. It's like a path dependent process. You're taught what your teacher was taught, who is taught to do economics like his teacher taught him and so forth. And you get locked into this particular path. So all in all, I think he's a right thinking kind of economist. He's working hard on how does modern monetary theory relate to the European Union and so forth. And I think that's wonderful. Yep, for sure. Um, Joe, um, if you're trying to post a link in the comments section, that's a YouTube thing, not me. Um, I know you or you can you can post links in the comments underneath the video, but in the chat itself, I do believe you can't do that. That's that's not me. I don't care. You guys want to post links to the best porn site. I don't I don't give a shit. Do whatever you want. Um, but YouTube prevents it. I, I, it's out of out of my control. Daniel, what did you think of Dirk? Um, I thought it was good. I, I I I had a criticism for you though, Ty, because um, and I think it's something that underlines the show in general. Um, it you know when we when we preface something and say how do we make economics better, more equitable for all, um, there's um, and and get into this real feel good sort of um ethical response um we're kind of setting ourselves up to move it away from a scientific observational uh um approach to that describes reality to um to something that is um moving it in the way that we think it should be moving rather than describing the science and um i know that as a discipline economics isn't quite there yet but I, I want to caution the group from from doing that. I mean, you know, is that a blind spot for economists? Is that a blind spot for Mike and for for Ty and and for and for Steve? Right? I mean, does it come into our purview to structure things for a more fair and equitable distribution of wealth for all of the world? Or, you know, like I, I just I big question mark over my head about that. So if you read the textbooks, which I question you reading anything from ManQ, there you have two sections. You have positive economics and normative economics. So at the end, I was speaking at a, a normative level, what ought to be, you know, what ought to happen. And it is true that it's when I ask that question, it's from a subjective um, perception from my, myself, right? I don't live in the global self to really appreciate what what people have to go through down there. But I have an idea, and I think it is important to have that in the conversation. There are some things we don't even know how to have the conversation about to begin to model. For instance, if we wanted to apply system dynamics, we've got to apply what our normative thinking is to great behavioral functions. Um, so I, I, I agree with you that... I think economics has to be pushed into a more scientific direction, but there's always room for that normative um, conversation. I, uh, Mike, what do you think about Dan's critique? Well, uh, first of all, Ty, I love your answer because that's exactly what I thought. There's positive economics and normative economics that's taught in Econ 101, what is and what ought to be. Um, we, um, But, you, you know, you want to make sure you're, uh, cognizant of which one you're, you're you're talking about when you get into trouble, I suppose, when you think you're talking about what is, but it's really what you wish it were. You know, that I don't mean you, but a person or economist in general. From a system dynamics point of view, um, you know, we, we the way I like to think about it or talk about it is, you know, we have an airplane or some complex system, let's say an airplane, and it's flying, but not very well. And uh, so we would model the, the airplane as it is, right? And then we say, how would we like it to fly? What's the problem? It should fly faster. It should fly farther, more fuel efficiently, less emissions, smoother, you know, what, whatever. And then you say, how should we redesign it so that it flies better, meets our, our, our criteria of what better is, right? So that's sort of the what is and what, what ought to be, I suppose, from a systems point of view. But lastly, when you start working with people, 
on some problem in a complex system and you say, you know, well, what ought to be, you know, what should we look for with a redesign? It's rarely straightforward. You know, something is bad and is going up. We want the bad thing to go down. That's obvious, you know, but usually there's a multi-attribute, multi-criteria um, scoring metric that we can specify for what at the attributes of a, of a good flying plane are, of a well-functioning economy. And you find that when you get more of this, you often get less of that. If you get more of that, you get less of this. So really you're looking at trade-offs and you're saying, okay, on net, what's the best thing? We might have to fly a little slower to be a little more fuel efficient and so forth. And so that gets into values, right? As to what, you know, you want to get there quicker. You want to, somebody else wants to get there with a smaller carbon footprint. Well, <laughs> you know, so there's, it's, it's almost like not one obvious answer, right? And it, it requires negotiation and thoughtfulness and trade-offs, or at least being aware of trade-offs and so forth. So a great, great response. My wife is in the chat for the first time on the show, Marie, and my mother-in-law is here as well watching the show. Um, they're saying I'm doing a great job, but I think it's mostly because I have my hair done properly. I think what we're going to do next is go into this uh, Minsky tutorial video. So for everybody um, that doesn't know, for about a year now, I've had a YouTube channel. I built it up. Um, I'll bring up the link. So you can learn system dynamics using Minsky with this channel. I do lots of example models, pandemic models, supply chain models, macro models. I show how you can, you know, use the godly tables. So I've got a little video here. I want I want to play it for people. Uh, the, the software is free. I'll put that link up as well. It's um, open source. So you can download it for free. You get all the features. Um, so to relate it, Vincent, you can get a free student type version, but you don't have all the versions. Stella, I don't even think Stella has a free version. You have a reader version, but uh, you can't actually model anything in it. So with at least with Minsky, you download the package, you, you, you get everything you need. So we're gonna play that now. System dynamics can be compared to a bathtub. You have a faucet. The faucet increases the level of the bathtub. Meanwhile, a drain decreases the level of a bathtub. System dynamics uses integration, or commonly referred to as accumulation. Accumulation is a gradual, non-instantaneous increase or decrease in the quantity over time. An accumulator is also referred to as a stock or a level and represents the state of the system. To accumulate is the act of increasing or decreasing the size of the state variable or stock over time. If you've downloaded the Minsky software, open it up now. Start by going to your widgets bar. In the widgets bar, click on the integrate button. This will bring up an integrate block and a stock variable attached to each other. By grabbing either one, you can move them around the canvas. You can right click on the stock variable and toggle the variable binding. This separates the integrate block and the stock variable so they can be moved around independently. By right-clicking on the stock variable, you can select Edit. This is where you can edit the name of the stock or change the variable type, among other things. To delete an element on the canvas, simply highlight it, right-click, and click Cut. An alternative way is to go up into the widgets bar and select Variable. Here, you can type the name of the variable, the type of the variable, initial values, units, and many other things. 
You can select any name you would like. It does not matter. In this situation, we're going to call this Canvas Deposit Accounts. This represents a stock. We're not going to worry about any of the other options below, as we'll cover that in a later episode. You can place the stock variable anywhere on the canvas. Right click and add an integral. This attaches an integrate block to the back of the stock variable. As before, now you can right click on the integrate block and toggle the variable binding attaching them both so they can be moved around together. You can select a name for a variable, and in this case, we're going to have a flow. An alternative way is to simply type the name of the variable using your keyboard. This automatically brings up a menu. Simply type in the name you'd like, click OK, and this will bring up a context menu for the variable. In this case, we want a flow, and the name of the variable is income. You can drag this flow variable anywhere on the canvas. We'll repeat the process, but this time we will have a flow variable called spending. Click OK and place a variable anywhere on the canvas. System Dynamics uses differentiation for its equations, but below the surface, it uses a process called integration. Integration is everything that happens below the line, as opposed to differentiation, which is everything on the line. In this case, we want to select an initial condition for the stock. We go up into the Variable tab, select a constant, and in this case, we'll pick 100 units. Click OK, place the unnamed constant anywhere on the canvas. Now with your mouse, drag from the circle of the constant to the bottom input circle of the integrate block. Notice when we press the recalculate button, the stock variable will now inherit the initial condition of 100. Next, we go up into our binary operations in our widget toolbar. We are going to select the subtract operator. We know income increases the deposit account. We also know that spending decreases the deposit account. You can move any of your elements around the canvas as you please. You can lasso a group of elements and move them around together. We now attach the subtract variable to the top input on the integrate block. We have now created an ordinary differential equation. Income increases the deposit account, spending decreases the deposit account. We can click on the Equations tab and actually look at the mathematical equation itself. As you can see, income and spending is yet to be defined in this simple model. The initial condition is 100, and we've created an ordinary differential equation. Canvas deposit account over DT equals income minus spending. Minsky has a very unique feature. That is the godly tables. Go up into the widget toolbar and click the bank icon. 
you can give the bank icon a title. In this case, we'll call it bank account. Right click on the bank icon or godly table and select open godly table. We now have an accounting table with assets, liabilities, and equity that should always balance to zero. This is double entry bookkeeping accounting. The stocks are in each column. We'll represent the same stock as before, but now we'll call it Godly Deposit Accounts. We have now created a new stock. The initial conditions are the same as the constant we created of 100 on the canvas. In this situation, we simply type in 100. Notice that it does not balance to zero. This is because monetary transactions start from one place and go to another. And double entry bookkeeping accounting requires two entries. In this case, we'll create an equity stock. This equity stock should be 100. This is because assets are 100. We have no liabilities. So our equity automatically equals 100. Next, by clicking the green plus sign, we'll start including our flows. As before, we have a flow that's called income. We can right click and copy to save time from typing. Copy income in the godly deposit account. This has to balance with another entry. We do this in the equity column. Create another flow row this time for spending. As before, right click and copy to save time. Paste in the godly deposit account table. Spending is a decrease from the deposit account. In order to do this, we put a minus sign in front of the word. This changes the text to red. Alternatively, we can use the debit and credit style. This is familiar to bankers. We have DR and CR. We need to balance the spending row. Spending is going to decrease the equity as it's a decrease for the asset. We've now replicated what we did initially on the canvas. We can change the godly table icon into a visual representation of the table and resize it. Notice we have the exact same results for the canvas deposit account and the godly deposit account. In addition, we now have an equity stock. If we look at the equations in the equations tab, notice the canvas deposit account is identical to the godly deposit account with the addition of an equity stock. Make sure you always save your files in Minsky. Once you save a file, the program will automatically update in case of a crash. mute myself. That is Minsky in a nutshell. Um, I tried to show in that video the how we, we kind of differentiate from a normal system dynamic program where 
if I could relate it to you're working on the canvas with um, Vincent or Stella, uh, and although they have advantages over Minsky, Minsky has advantages over them, and mainly that's in the godly table. So I created the same equation there uh, two different ways. And when you're dealing with many, many, like 20 different stocks, the godly table is a lot more applicable. And I actually explore building a large godly table and doing it in Vinsim in another video. You can find those videos at Ty Keens uh, on my YouTube channel. If you just want to learn about system dynamics and not actually practice anything, it's a great, great kind of starter channel. Now, what I really want to do potentially in the after show is spend about 10 or 15 minutes uh, in each show and we could build up a large macro model. Now, I've been watching the viewers. We didn't lose any viewers during that time. Um, we're we're just at least on YouTube. I haven't looked on t Twitter. So this might be a potential thing where Mike and I could build something up. Steve's having internet connection problems, as as always. Also, hey, hit the like button, um, chat on the side, subscribe. If you're on YouTube, you know what, to, or on Twitter, you know what to do. Retweet, like, come over here and chat. And also underneath the video. Let us know how much you like Dirk Entz for this show. Um, that's really good for the algorithm. I'm sure it boosts Dirk's uh, ego when he reads those comments later. I also t tell us how much you like uh, Mike Radzicki, too. I'm sure he'll read the comments, too. He needs an ego boost. Tell Daniel how good he he looks with that beard. He'll, he'll need the ego boost. And also, tell me how I look in all these new suits I'm wearing each week. I do read the comments. Um... And I hmm. usually focus in on the bad ones. Or... There's always, out of uh, 10 comments, there's always one bad comment. Apparently, last week, me mentioning kangaroos was yeah, a yeah, no-no okay. to some yeah, person. That's why I was having frustration about getting online beforehand. So I've started installing your song. We'll, we'll put him back off to the side again. I think he's talking on the phone. <laughs> Mm. Mike, what do you think? I know we're tr maybe thinking about trending cycles. What do you think about having a little segment where we kind of just build up a, a, a system dynamic macro model to kind of show people how the economy works, show people what system dynamics is at the same time? What do you think? Uh, yeah, just a, sort of an, to illustrate it. Sure, we can do that. Cool. Daniel, what do you think? I think um, trending cycles um, is something that on the air we could flush out and talk about and maybe even get some good, valuable um, way in from the audience. I think that would be a great idea. Yeah, so I think uh, this is a perfect time. We've tried this before, but we've just been busy with having other guests in. Is Mike, can you give another synopsis of what you want trending cycles to be, what your vision and vision of it is, and maybe we can get some comments from the viewers, uh, what they think and how maybe you could proceed going forward. Uh Sure. Uh, so I, I've been working m most of my professional career, I suppose, on figuring out how to interface system dynamics and economics in a manner that would be deemed acceptable to both system dynamicists and economists. I think I've kind of figured out how to do it. I'm not saying it's perfect, but I, you know, more or less have an answer for that. Uh, and um, if you talk to the folks at the System Dynamics Society, they're sort of the international clearinghouse for all things system dynamics. They'll tell you that the two most frequent requests they get are, number one, where can I learn how to do system dynamics? <clears throat> Excuse me, and not necessarily get a degree in it, but learn how to do it. And then number two, um, I'm interested in system dynamics applied to economics. So trending cycles is intended to be a place where someone can go to, to do those things, learn how to do system dynamics and learn how to apply it to economics in a manner that would be deemed acceptable to both economists and system dynamics, system dynamics. There are not that many people in the world who are formally trained in both areas. <laughs> 
So I happen to be one of them. I'm not the only one, but it's not like there's, you know, tens of thousands of us running around. So I think it's sort sort of a unique niche that uh, uh, we can occupy with trending cycles. Steve is certainly one of those folks. And of course, uh, Ty, Dan, and our guests are folks who are interested in this same area and have different different levels of expertise. And we welcome all who uh, actually care about this. <laughs> so in you know, in a nutshell, that's that's what we're up to with trending cycles. And I'm all ears as to be the best way to do it with a think thinkific courses and YouTube channels and what what uh, live streams and what have you. Dan, Dan, what do you kind of think about this? Uh, I want I want your opinion and input. The form is going to be really important and the workflow is going to be really important. So I think that um, any initiative that is starting off to gain momentum, the it's it is tough and um, uh, it, it's it's something that um, I think we're going to need um, buy in from all the people putting the work in. And I think then it'll be about putting our head down and getting the work done and um, uh, distributing the labor so that it doesn't all fall onto Ty's shoulders or just Mike's shoulders, right? I mean, uh, and and maybe anybody that's listening out there is interested in participating and, and um, you know, playing a role. We'd love to hear from you, right? Um, I I know we mentioned Thinkific. Um, is that locked in stone? I'm rather uh, rather stunned about uh, signing up for what it was priced at nine ninety five. <laughs> he, he's here with us he's just on the phone he's here in spirit with us right you yeah know? he's here guys uh everybody that's watching steve keen has not forgot about you carry on dan no, carry yeah. on yeah and then the only other thing well two things first off um my my um desire to get into minsky and to model something um is i'd love to do it from a philosophical model and so um, uh, the the inputs coming into the into the um, bathtub, so to speak, um, would be um, information flow. And then I would like to model something that where the limiting output factor had something to do with our ability to speak and communicate. Right. So I remember reading something in philosophy a while ago that. Um, actually estimated the amount of information that the human brain can actually receive and process on a um on a on a moment to moment basis and then i'd like to be able to frame that from a like a semantics linguistic chunk standpoint to go well grammars are actually um put together in chunks and meaning is derived from a series or a sequence of those chunks and so uh, that's kind of, I know I'm going from ground zero in a, in a, in a complex system up to something uh, very, very complex, but I've kind of got my eye on that, um, uh, that because it just, it's inconceivable to try and model it. And we've had people and generations and philosophers before me that, that try and come up with these grand systems that effectively um, describe how the mind works and um, and, and differentiate between things like we were talking about earlier, like normative ethics or um, metaf metaphysics versus um, material substance, these kinds of things. And I think um, taking and building a philosophical model would be my primary uh, academic interest in that. Um, the only other thing I'd like to add with this particular project is that um, I own a media outlet called Plank Sip, and one of the reasons why I started Plank Sip was um, not to herd cats, I mean academics, but was to um, explain to academics that they inherently have a bias and a negative tinge towards anything that is monetized. And um, I think the monetization question is it a very important one. Um, I think monetization allows something to scale. And I see a desperate need 
and a desperate want and desire both from Mike and from Steve to want to have this replicate and disseminate to um, in in to as many as possible. And I think that if we implement a a monetization strategy, those should be the foundational. That should be the foundational teleology. That goal underlying the project, and. Um, we shouldn't be scared of it. We shouldn't think that we're greedy capitalists. Um, we should approach it in a in, in a way that um, keeps that goal in mind. So those are my thoughts. Excellent stuff. I'll sidestep. We'll go back to trending cycles here in a second. I want to answer this question because this stuff, I, I get tickled by it. So the question is, have you ever built a model to merge World 3, the Goodwin cycle model, uh, the this is um, bombed is Steve's way for endogenous money. So it's bank origin or originated uh, money and debt. Uh, that's what Steve calls uh, endogenous money theory and the world of iron giants. So yes, actually I have created a model that integrates the iron giant model, but just the energy aspect. So uh, and with the uh, Liefton uh, production um, function, I've added energy as an input. So it has labor and uh, labor as an input um, uh, into capital uh, to create output. I've also added energy into it. And without energy, the whole thing falls apart. You can lower labor um and it'll change it by uh, you know rate of change but if you remove uh en energy uh labor relies on energy and capital relies on energy so i have integrated that i have attempted not with the world three model but with the world two model which is a lot less complex uh to try to add a cycle a goodwin cycle model into it and actually the new earth for all model is playing around with the cycles in it. I haven't, there's like 800 variables in it, so I haven't picked it apart yet. But it's something that interested me if we could have the cycles within the world models. Um, would it give any more information? I don't know, because the time horizon for the, the world model is so, so large. Just mute Mike there and Daniel. It's so large um on the time scale I, I just i don't think it provides any more so instead of a uh, exponential lines going you have squiggly exponential lines would it give any more information i don't know but i have explored um adding like pollution and co2 into the goodwin models as well so um and along with energy energy depletion um to bring those aspects of the world model and the feedback effects into it. And maybe next week I'll, I'll actually bring up that model. It's, it's quite large in itself and I'm still playing around with it. I've also integrated the whole MMT, um, you know, operational reality of how money works into it. So interesting question. I love that stuff. I, I could do a whole two hours just talking about geeky system dynamic models, but I'm going to steer it back um, onto trending cycles. It's something that I, I've actually started working on a document this past week to send to Mike with some of my ideas. Um, I think Mike needs to get, get a tweet. Uh, Mike, that's something you need to, when I do the, um, the promos for the show, I have a big Twitter audience. Um, and I can't actually, I don't, I can't at Mike Radzicki on Twitter. I can do it on LinkedIn, but I only have 70 follow, followers on LinkedIn. So nobody gives a shit about me there. So maybe, uh, open up a Twitter handle. Um, and this kind of goes into, if we're going to do this, we're going to need a YouTube page. We're going to need a Twitter page. We're going to need a LinkedIn page. I don't really like Facebook, but we probably need a Facebook and Instagram page. Um, and we need to start pumping it out at the end of these shows. We got to promote, 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 right? System dynamics, economics, the right way to do it. That's kind of my idea. Um, and at the same time, I've, I, I was when I looked at your course material, I thought, shit, there's nothing I can add there. Mike's got it all covered, historical aspects and whatnot. But I I do think I could provide a Minsky um, 
kind of course that would augment it and provide more context. Um, what are you thinking, Mike? Do we need to get this out on social media? What's your ideas? Yeah, first of all, uh, absolutely. And, um, you know, I'm all ears if I need to start tweeting or get a Twitter account and what have you. Uh, easy to do, happy to do that. I'm, uh, I'm happy to take guidance from people who know a little bit more about, you know, uh, uh, using social media properly. I mean, I'm certainly aware of it and, and aware that we need to use it, but I'm not an expert in exactly how to use it. That, you know, get the most leverage out of it. So I'm all ears. Uh, I do think that I don't have all the answers with what I'm preparing for trending cycles. Uh, certainly presenting things from uh, sort of the same material with a different platform, software platform. There's room for that. Not everybody needs to use the same software. We have people doing system dynamics with R, with Python, with spreadsheets, with Vensim with Stella, with Minsky, with PowerSim. And just because I happen to work in Stella doesn't mean that everybody has to do that. And the various packages and approaches have their strengths and weaknesses. So having a, you know, a broader presentation of uh, economic stuff with, with different packages, I think is quite important. I think we are at the beginning of a new microeconomics. I think we can redo microeconomics properly from sort of a heterodox economics, institutionalist perspective, as Dirk was uh, mentioning. Uh, I mentioned earlier about how, um, you know, economists don't traditionally get out from behind their desks and ask people what they do. Institutional economists do. The story is that John Commons, one of the founding fathers of institutional economics, you taught at the University of Wisconsin, my home state, and he was primarily, if you had to categorize him, he was a labor economist. Well, the story is, if you wanted to write your dissertation on labor economics under John Commons, the first thing he had you do was go work as a laborer. He says, how can you possibly know what these people do unless you do it? So after you do that, now let's talk about doing a doctoral dissertation uh, in, in, in labor economics, right? So, you know, uh, expanding that to, um, oh, and another, another uh, uh, institutional economist, uh, uh, Gardner Ackley, was a World War I fighter pilot, you know, with like the Red Baron and uh, Eddie Rickenbacker and all that, um, biplanes and triplanes and all that. And after World War I, he came out and made a, uh, created a business. I think he sold blankets. Then he decided to get a, a PhD in economics. He went to Harvard and he was in a microeconomics course, which is called price theory, sometimes called price theory. And the professor was explaining to him how prices were set, <laughs> neoclassical economics. And he's like, I did this for, I ran a business for, well, that's not at all what happens. <laughs> Like your models are crazy. So he spent the rest of his professional economics career uh, writing books and articles and whatever on how prices are actually set in different businesses and different industries. And it's not at all what the traditional economic theory says. So that, again, is a, an example of, you know, finding out what people really do, right? And then making it, you know, writing textbooks, having courses and on and on. And I think that is where we can all work together. So what should a new microeconomics look like? Using these tools, finding out what people really do, including the important stuff, right? One last thing I want to say, Dan stimulated my thinking about coming at this with a philosophical approach. And um, I would say anything you can describe, a person can describe precisely, we can model. Therein lies the challenge. How do you uh, precisely describe kind of soft variables, philosoph philosophical concepts, and what have you? I'm reminded at this annual system dynamics conference for years, for decades, this guy would show up. I think by training, he was an electrical engineer. He's since passed away, but he would always present a, pre uh, a paper on a system dynamics model 
of mystical experiences. And it was filled with all of these soft variables and, and, and uh, uh, non-quantifiable ideas, but he was able to run simulations and say, say things about mystical experiences. Another example, um, some scholars from Israel one year presented a model of charismatic leaders and you know what it means to be charismatic but it was formally modeled so if you can precisely define it we can model it so i think again there's the door is open for those sorts of models um i want to just um we're gonna switch it to dan here in a sec because i want to talk about planks up since we're going to promote trending cycles we got to give dan some light on planks up but i want to thank lana dell lana dell's our, our unofficial ambassador on twitter to promote the show she puts out um little tweets and stuff so we have just let's I'm going to put this out here. We are the number one heterodox economic live stream on the Internet right now. That's without a doubt. And that may be because there's no other live streams that cover the topic. <laughs> but nonetheless, we are. There are podcasts, a lot of them right now covering MMT. And one, for instance, we had a guest named Steve Grumbine about a month and a half ago. He's got his whole network and a bunch of people that retweet his stuff, right? And we don't quite have that yet, although we are developing quite a, a little fellowship, you could say. Uh, Lana is one of those people that is pumping our show up. Um, Ghost on the Half Shelf does a lot of commenting on. I want to recognize those people that are pumping the show up. Botch Mandela, always here. TR. Um, downtown C Christmas Tree or Xmas Tree. Um, you know, all you people, if, if you're on Twitter or LinkedIn, you want to do a little retweet or maybe even on Facebook, we kind of need that crew behind us um, like Steve Grumbine has with uh, Real Progressives. Um, they're not necessarily our competition. In fact, they're friends of ours. We're all promoting the same thing. They've got their number one little podcast, and we've got the number one heterodox live stream on the Internet. Daniel... Talk about planksip.org. Oh, I took them off. Here we go. Hold on, Daniel. I'm sorry. I want to share with you guys, and this is um, I'm I'm going to merge Planksip with what we were talking about uh, on last week's show. I brought up the story of Adam Smith and the butcher, the brewer, and the baker. We were earlier talking, um, or Mike was talking about. Um, you know what we can do at a or we're looking to build a new micro economy uh for me to get buy-in i need to address this head on is um and confront the concept of individual self-interest and um, the story of the butcher the brewer and the baker from adam smith is um usually looked at uh uh, from two angles. One is the division of labor, labor, which really is nothing new. That is something that was talked about way back in Plato's time. And, and uh, I think it's just, um, and, and, and well before that, I think that's just a description of um, societies in general, uh, how they flourish, you start dividing labor. Um, but it's more important, more importantly for me, it's this, it's this quote here, and it is, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love, and we never talk to them of our own necessities, but of their advantages. And this is from Adam Smith, an inquiry into the nature and causes of wealth of nations, volume one. Um, this is a page on Planksip, and um, this is fundamental to how I'm describing social proof and beyond. The article uh, on Planksip goes into um, basically what we're trying to do here for this show and what I do with a lot of academics and people trying to be thought leaders. And I put those into this into a similar category. 
thought leaders and academics, people that want to put themselves out there and try and build an audience. Now, I advocate for the slow burn. I advocate for putting um, truthful information out. And I advocate for um, uh, mediums like YouTube because it's the world's second biggest search engine. Um, and the, the accumulation over time within YouTube, if you're putting out good content, can continue to increase and increase and increase. It doesn't have um, a, a short cycle to it, right? So that's what I suggest. I suggest that we, uh, to this, to all academics and, and thought leaders, if they're trying to, they have a body of thought and a body of work that they want to try and get out to a mainstream, um, then that's what I recommend. And that's what we do to help that community on plank set. So that's my little spiel. Good stuff, Daniel. I'm a big supporter of Planksip. I actually write my blogs on Planksip. Um, you can find that on my Twitter um, profile. And I think I put it on my LinkedIn Pro. You can find a link uh, to uh, my blogs there. A lot of, a lot of great stuff. I, I really like the idea of Planksip. I think we're going to cover the last topic before we go here, and that's Donald Trump. We have a former sitting U.S. president that has now been indicted. I want thoughts from people watching on the, in the, the comments, chats on the side. And as an American, I know Mike will have to tr tread carefully, so I don't really want to pick on Trump. But I want to I want to get the feeling as an American how it feels to have a former president be indicted. Now, whether this goes anywhere. What is the feeling down there? I know you have a left and right divide that's quite heavy down there. Uh, how how are the dynamics of that down there? And I'm just asking out of curiosity. Well, um, I guess my overall impression of what's happening is that it, uh, we've crossed the Rubicon. That um, heretofore, this sort of thing has not happened, where you, in some sense, use the legal system to go after your political opponents. And so, in a world of where there's feedback tit for tat, um, the Republicans are probably going to say, "Okay, uh, when we're in charge, you know, or we'll get a friendly, you know, uh, DA, and we'll go after one of yours." And then it'll just escalate. So I think, particularly in light of you know this uh, hush money to a porn star and all that, I mean, uh, it's, it, it it was treasonous or something. You say, well, you know, but it sounds kind of Mickey Mouse, you know, not it's it's apparently often a misdemeanor, uh, and they're making a big production out of it. And so there, you know, it's. I think they're they're saying, okay, you're going to do that. Well, wait till we're in charge. We're going to do it right back to you, and it's going to just escalate and get worse. Um, Daniel, your your thoughts as a Canadian, um, just viewing it. What are your thoughts on what's happening? Well, I loved what my wife said about it. Was that you better get it right because the um, up until now nothing is stuck, and if you're going to waste all of this time on things that are um, not going to stick uh, or have kind of like a um, like a, a shallow depth of of, um, of evidence for it and I think it's it's a mistake you know I think it's a mistake to do it and I, I kind of was shaking my head I was just disappointed to hear what Mike was saying that if if this is on a misdemeanor or if it, then it, it 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 seems more political as posturing and like right mike said about crossing the rubicon and it's like tit for tat strategies don't work um and i you know it's funny where my mind went with that i said well like if 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 the tit for tat strategies don't work which we know in in game theory and and that it that it doesn't um uh you know what, what? What would the ideal situation in a political move be? Uh, somebody like, <laughs> like Biden say, actually, you know what? I'm just going to relinquish power over to the uh, Republicans, and um, please, uh, 
you know, do your best. Thanks for, <laughs> you know, we trust that you're going to be good people, <laughs> you know, and like, let, let's, let's stop fighting each other and let's stay away from the tit for tat and uh, let's agree to work together, you know, sort of thing. And in fact, I'll be such a good man. I'll give up power. What do you think? <laughs> you know, like, would that be, whoa, really? He's doing, he's stepping down to give you know, Republicans the power because he wants to make a better America? Wow, is that the opposite of tit for tat? Mm, interesting. We know it never happened, but, you know, like, you know, what is the antithesis of that, of that tit for tat in our current reality or the current reality of the American politics? That's, that's what I was kind of thinking about. Yeah, I'll, I agree with both of you. Um, really, I, I'm talking to my wife. I, I, I think it's a dangerous, dangerous precedent. Um, I'll, I'll put it out there. I'm not a, a Trump fan. I, everybody knows I'm, I lean to the left, um, although he was quite entertaining for four years. Thank you, America. Um, great stuff. Um, right up there, you know, Obama was entertaining for all the right reasons in a lot of ways. In my heart, uh, Trump was entertaining for all the, the wrong ways in my heart. Um, but I, I think it's awfully dangerous to set that pre uh, precedent. One, because it's divisive in a country that's already very divided. I am, I don't see from a social standpoint how it helps America. Um, the legal implications, let's face it, this isn't quite the biggest crime on the planet. There are other things in the pipeline with Trump that may, may be more serious, but this, this seems like maybe a New York DA vendetta. I don't know. I'm, I, I don't know all the details, but I think it's a risky road we go down. And I, I also agree with Mike, you know, the next time the Republicans are in power, you know, any small thing, we're going to turn to the judicial system to handle a political matter. And that's dangerous for democracy. That's awfully dangerous. And the, the scariest part is the biggest democracy on the planet right now is the United States. And uh, as a, a globe, that's the last thing we need um, is a fractured America, which it's already quite fractured in a lot of ways. Um, so that's kind of my thoughts on it. I don't think Trump should get away with murder or is above the law. But at the same time, presidents do uh, inhabit a different realm and it can become very dangerous when you set different presidents or precedences um, with these individuals. So I, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it'll be interesting to see how it uh, unfolds. Um, I think we're, we're kind of getting close to the end of the, I'm just going to read. Oh, I've got to leave right at 11. So Daniel <laughs> is sending a private message that he doesn't want the audience to hear. He is getting tired no, of the audience. I just want to put that out there. No, Mike, no, Mike, no, Mike, and, the Mike and I love you guys, but Dan's getting tired of you. <laughs> no, no. Oh, man. Okay, yeah. Okay, well, final thoughts from Dan, and then I'll get final thoughts from Mike about the show in general. No, it's really good. And I got to give the props out to Ty. He's done a lot of work graphically. And I, 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 I love seeing this come together. He is a, a, a top notch video producer and uh, podcast producer. He's done uh, improvements every single week. And, you know, for all you guys tuning in, just, you know, see what he's going to do next week. He's just raising the bar every single week. So, yeah. Thank you, Ty. You're doing a great job. Dan Daniel, you're so kind. Mike, final thoughts. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, in the very short time I've been with you guys, on the order of a month. Again, every week it's better. More, uh, more viewers, more improved uh, graphics, whatever humor. It's all really great. I, I, I can't wait to see what's uh, what's coming next. So, rah rah, push on. <laughs> Wow, that that is that is some pressure. Now I'm gonna really have to excel over the next seven days to put something up there that matches. I want to thank everybody that's tuned in, like Mike and Daniel have just said. I'll go through the list one more time. I've got Mike to read it. I got Daniel to read it. I'll read it this time. We've got Ghost on the Half Shelf, Lana Dell hates the clock, Joe WWE fan, J Bay. 
Suresha. I don't even know that one either. Sorry, buddy, but we love that you're here. Thomas, real progress in action. Double K, Randy Hunt. I kind of changed the my algorithm on picking that list. Actually, Restream gave me a top uh, list automatically. Restream is what we use to do these streams. They've taken that out as of last week. So I had to actually manually go into YouTube and write down all the chatters. And I decided, okay, instead of you just, you know, having the most comments, because anybody can just type one word at a time, I thought, okay, what are the most thoughtful comments? And then I didn't put them in any particular order. And if you didn't make it on the list this week, because we had like 37 separate chatters last week, um, I, it's not that I didn't see you. Like I can only put so many on that list. Um, hopefully we get you on the next time. We're going to be back in two weeks. So next week is Easter. We're not going to be here, guys. I'm sorry. I got to spend some time with my family. But I am planning a best of uh, the first 20 live streams. So it'll be hopefully I can get an hour long show in. It'll be pre recorded. Uh, all the funny stuff, mostly Steve fucking up as usual. Um, we'll probably get a little bit of Mike in there because he's been around. I think this is the fourth show in the row. So he'll be in there. Dan will be in there. We'll make sure we highlight his beard. I'll be there with all my shitty jokes. Um, until then, I guess that will be a wrap. We will see you next, well, two weeks from now, but you can still watch next week in the best of. Uh, just to let you know, two weeks from now, uh, we do have a special guest, but I'm not going to tell you. So see you later, guys. Bye.